you can open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, we're going to be in this Old Testament book, this prophetic book, one that I don't know, <clears throat> I could do like a show of hands thing, but I don't know if many would shoot up. Uh, how many have had a Christmas sermon on Daniel chapter 7? Um, so we've been going through this series, Adventus, looking at Jesus and how he is the coming, the arriving king. And we've been approaching that, um, acknowledging that he is the royal son. He's the son of, De of Adam. We saw that the first week, who, who became the second Adam, who did what Adam could not do, and who is redeeming Adam's race, all of mankind, because he took on human form, he took on flesh. We saw last week how he is the son of David, the rightful king to the earthly throne, but also the king of, of the universe. And today we're going to look at how he is the son of man and how that's different from him being son of Adam. And then next week we'll look at how he is son of God. There's overlap in all of these titles. But what I want to say about this title, the son of man, is that this title was actually used by Jesus about himself, describing himself, more than any other title. He used it over 51 times. You could say as many as 88 if you uh, pair all those up together in the phrases. But 51 separate times he uses this title. And every time, he's the one that uses it. It shows up 51 times in the New Testament, and Jesus himself is the one that uses it. And so this title, Son of Man, Jesus saw as being very important. On November 22nd, just this past year, a woman by the name of Ashley McKinney, she's 39 years old, she lives in Belleville, Illinois, was sentenced to 54 months in federal prison for identity theft. She stole the identity and the savings of an 86-year-old woman, also from Belleville, Illinois. Identity theft is a pretty big deal. To steal someone else's identity, to assume someone else's identity as your own. And this is actually what the Pharisees, what the scribes, what the, uh, the, the chief priest, this is what they thought Jesus was doing. When he assumed the title Son of Man, they thought he was stealing someone else's identity. A very important someone. You read the New Testament and you see this phrase, Son of Man, and you might not realize what all the implications of that title are. That's part of what I hope to be able to show you from Daniel chapter 7 this morning. But the Pharisees hated him for it. That he would use this title, they killed him for it. That was his sentence. That was part, the kind of the final straw in his death sentence was the fact that he assumed this title, this identity, son of man. They said it was a crime, blasphemy. So this morning, as we look at Daniel chapter 7, what is behind this identity? What is so significant and so important about the title, son of man? Well, let's take a look in Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 9. <clears throat> as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold... With the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, 
and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts and are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. This morning, as we think about the title Son of Man that Jesus assumed for himself, called himself, took this identity upon himself, I want to point out three things. The first is that this title means that he is a prophet of warning. And I'll explain that in a second. The second is that he is the savior of his people. And then the third is that he is the king and judge of the world. So he is a prophet of warning. Where do I get that? Well, actually, um, there's little uh, pieces of this here in this passage, but... In a sermon like this, it's, it's when you're doing kind of a topical approach, it's hard to get everything out of one specific text. And so the, where this point comes from is actually from the prophet Ezekiel. If you were to read the book Ezekiel, you see that God consistently calls Ezekiel son of man. And the reason that is, is son of man, yes, was also a title for human beings, for male human beings specifically, to say you, you are human. And so there is that in it. But the reason I say in this sermon that we're, we're tying that in to tie that in with Jesus being this prophet of warning is because Ezekiel's message and ministry was one of warning to the Israelites, to the tribe of Israel, that they would be taken into exile, that God's judgment was coming. And that was not a well-received message. Ezekiel was not a prophet that they liked. Ezekiel suffered. He had to go through many symbolic demonstrations of God's judgment on his people. And Ezekiel was a prophet who was rejected, <clears throat> who suffered, but whose prophecy ultimately came true. He was a prophet of warning whose prophecy came true. And in Jesus' ministry, you see this same thing playing out. So part of that title, Son of Man was to recognize Jesus is a prophet like Ezekiel who has come with a message of salvation, but also a message of repentance and warning for those who do not repent and turn back to, to the Lord. In John 1, verses 50 to 51, there's an interaction that Jesus has with Nathaniel, one of his disciples. It's when he first meets Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is walking towards him. He's been uh, he's been told by Philip, who is either like a friend or a brother or a cousin or somebody, he's been told by Philip, come see this man who this could be the Christ. And so Nathaniel's coming to meet this Jesus, and Jesus sees him coming, and he says, behold, a, a, an Israelite, a, a man in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel, when he gets up to Jesus, he said, how do you know who I am? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip even came and told you about me. And Nathanael at that said, surely you are the Christ, the Son of God. And, and Jesus' response is this. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is giving this Nathaniel who said, Wow, you must be the Son of God. You must be a great prophet. You knew I was sitting under the tree. And Jesus says, You think that's something? <laughs> You're going to see much greater things than that. 
you're going to see heaven opened. And when Jesus starts describing this scene, every good Jew would have immediately gone to these visions of the Old Testament of heaven opening and the king on his throne and the king, the son of man, coming down out of the clouds. And so Jesus saying, I am, yes, I am the Christ. I am the son of God, but I'm the son of man who is coming who, to, to claim his domain, to claim his kingdom. In other places, this idea of Jesus being this prophet, despised, rejected, Jesus is sharing with his disciples in Luke 17. He says, just as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. See, Jesus could have come in judgment right off the bat. He had every right to do that. He could have come and brought righteous judgment. He could have come and brought punishment on all sinners, all mankind. But he didn't do that. The first time he came, he came as a prophet of warning. Saying, yes, there is a judgment coming. Jesus actually preached about that coming judgment more than anyone else in the Bible. There is a judgment coming, but the first time I've come, it's not to condemn. It's not to judge. It's to offer salvation. It's to be rejected. It's to suffer. It's to die for my people. You see, the first advent, the first Christmas, the first coming of our king is one where he came in gentleness, in humility, with grace, with salvation. But he will come again. And he has promised and he has warned, just like Ezekiel, that when he comes, he will bring recompense. He will pay back everything on those who have done evil and have rebelled against him and who have not turned back to him in repentance and faith, trusting in him for salvation. And so that's the first thing, is that Jesus is a prophet of warning, just like Ezekiel. That this title, Son of Man, would have reminded people of that same message of Ezekiel, to repent, to turn back to the Lord, for judgment is coming, his righteous judgment. You know, we think about a message like this, and Merry Christmas, by the way. Um, we think about a message like this, and we don't think, about this being good news, right? Judgment? What, let's, let's, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the, the nice stuff, the fluffy stuff, right? But when you think about it, messages of warning are loving, aren't they? Are gracious, are merciful, are caring, are kind. You think about if you're walking... Um, out in nature somewhere, and you come across uh, this place where there's this old rickety bridge. And let's just say that rickety bridge has, you know, caution tape taping it off and, and a sign stuck up that says, you know, old bridge, not reliable, do not cross. Uh, and then maybe there's another sign that actually says, you know, I've been on a hiking trail before where, you know, this was about slippery rock. You know, so many people have died here at this location. Um, and then we went back the next year and the number had gone up on, uh, you know, this place where there's this waterfall and these slippery rock, right? So warning signs. Well, if somebody knew this was a dangerous location, this bridge was dangerous, this, these, these rocks are slippery and people have died here and they did nothing. Is that loving? Is that kindness? Well, we don't want to scare people. No. To be kind, to be merciful, to be gracious is to be honest about the danger that is ahead if you don't heed that warning. And Jesus, being the most gracious, the most loving, the most kind, the most caring, preached, prophesied, and warned about his coming judgment, but offered free forgiveness, free deliverance, free salvation to anyone who would repent. And so that's the first thing, is that he's a prophet of warning. 
The second thing is, is that he's the savior of his people. And this is where we'll go back to our passage. If you have your Bible, look at a couple of verses with me. Verse 18 Daniel has seen this vision and he's asked someone there, maybe it's an angel or someone, he's asked someone there, what are these things about? And the promise that this person makes to Daniel is that the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Jesus makes this promise that his people will reign with him. This is the image we get in Romans Chapter 8, that we will be more than conquerors through Christ. That there's an aspect to the promises of of Jesus' return that his very people will reign with him in his domain. This is actually what creation was supposed to be all about. When we were created in the image of God, he, he put his image in us and he gave us dominion over the earth, right? We were meant to fill the earth and rule it. Well, as part of that great story of redemption, Jesus is promising that when he comes back, all of that will be fulfilled. We will be saved, we will be perfected in the image of God, and we will rule his kingdom with him. He he being the ultimate king, we being his vice regents on earth. We will rule with him, reign with him. And so this Jesus is coming to save his people. There are several things throughout, several phrases that Jesus says throughout the New Testament in Mark 10, 45. He says, the son of man came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So the son of man, that title that he uses, I came to give my life and to serve so that I would be a ransom, that I would bring salvation for many. Luke 5 Starting at verse 17, he makes a promise that, um, that he will come. The Son of Man, it, it's this story. Okay, let me, let me go back for a second in my notes. Let me set up the scene for you. Jesus is in a house, and he's teaching. And there's this great crowd, <clears throat> and because they can't get in, these friends of this lame man dig a hole through the roof. You remember this story? They dig a hole through a roof, and they lower their friend down in front of Jesus. And Jesus sees this, and he sees the faith of the friends. He sees the faith of these people, and he says, Son or child, your sins are forgiven. And there are some Pharisees there, and they get really annoyed. (laughs) And they get really bothered, and they get kind of tense, and you can feel it. And maybe people could feel it in the room. Maybe they kind of glance at each other. Because what their thoughts are saying, what they're saying in their hearts and in their minds is, who can forgive sins but God alone? Who does this guy think he is to forgive sins? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, it says, knowing their thoughts, says, which is easier for me to tell this man, get up, take your mat, and walk, or to say, son, your sins are forgiven? Now, what Jesus is saying is, Visibly, it would be harder for me to say, get up, take your mat, and walk, because, I mean, you really have to see that happen, right? you got to have some proof. For me to say, son, your sins are forgiven, I can't give you visible proof of that, right? So then what he says is, so that you might know that the Son of Man, that's the title he uses, so that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. And he turns to the lame man. He says, son, get up, take your mat, and walk. And he does. Jesus, the Son of Man, now showing that he has authority to forgive sins? Who can do that but God alone? Nobody. Jesus, the Son of Man, showing that he is God in the flesh, the God-man who can forgive sins. And this is the picture that we get in Daniel 7. Go back and look at verses 13 and 14 in Daniel 7 if you're there. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom 
that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. You see, this Jesus, this one like a son of man, is given authority over all the earth that all peoples, all nations would serve, would worship him. Who deserves worship other than God? So Daniel 7 is showing us there is one who's like a human, but he's also like a divine being. Well, who is that? That's Jesus, the God-man, who came, who is the Son of Man, who took on flesh, who now rules and reigns. But this God-man has come to save his people. We read earlier together as part of our confession of faith, John 3, 16 and following. What does that say? It says, I came into the world not to condemn, but to save. Why? Because those who have not believed are already condemned. The judgment is coming. I came to save those who would turn and see the light and repent and believe. Jesus came not to condemn the first time, but he is coming in, ju in judgment again. And so he's the savior of his people. He came into the world to save his people from their sins, to offer his life as a ransom for many. You know, there's no question in the New Testament about Jesus, what Jesus was claiming and who he was portrayed to be when he took on this identity of son of man. A lot of people will argue, well, Jesus never claimed to be divine, right? He never claimed deity. You never see him say in uh, explicit terms, I am God, right? There was no question and this is just one example. There was no question about what Jesus was claiming to be when he said that he was the Son of Man. I want to give you another example of that from Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, this is at Jesus' trial. And he's been accused of, um, of saying that he would destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. There's been all these accusations, some of them false, some of them kind of twisted facts. And then here's what happens. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these man, men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him straight up. He said this, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed. Now, let's just pause. They knew exactly what they were asking him. They were All that's encompassed in that question for a good Jewish high priest scholar who knows the story of the Old Testament, what are they asking? Are you the one who was promised? Are you the Savior of the people? Are you the Messiah, the Christ, who's coming to save his people? The, the one that Daniel talks about, being divine and human. Is that you? And what does Jesus say? I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Pause. Seated at the right hand of power. Wait a second. If I go back to Daniel 7... It tells me that there's this son of man and that he's going to sit with the ancient of days on his throne and rule all things. Wait a second, Jesus. Sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I'm back in 14. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit here. He's sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Wait a minute. Pause. Daniel 7 also says that, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented all the kingdoms and all the worlds and all the nations. So Jesus is at his trial. He's been asked point blank, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed one? Are you the son of God? That's what the other gospels say. And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. And what was the high priest's response? The high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy yourself. What is your decision? And they all, the court, the, the, the court of the 
Jews said, it says they condemned him as deserving death. Why? Because Jesus just claimed, he just, what they thought, stole the identity of the Son of Man. Did he steal that identity? No. It was his. It was his rightful identity. And as the Son of Man, he is the Savior of his people. And the last thing we'll see is that he is the King and Judge of the world. You know, this, this picture of God being this brilliant person, this brilliant divine person and being with fiery flames, with burning fire, and actually he destroys his enemy, the beast. There's a lot of context to this, but in verse 11 it says the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And throughout the story of the Old Testament, there's all these judgments that take place that that fire pours down from heaven, bringing God's righteous judgment on sinful people. It happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened when, when Elijah was having this battle on Mount Carmel, right? And he, and he sets up his offering, his sacrifice, and he prays to God, and a fire from heaven pours down and consumes the whole offering. It also happened with David and Solomon when they first dedicated the temple, when they first brought sacrifices, it says fire from heaven poured down and consumed them. And then Isaiah prophesies about how in the end, God will send fire to cleanse and to purge and to destroy his enemies. Throughout the Old Testament, there's these pictures of fire coming down from heaven. And what does that represent? It represents God's righteous judgment on sinful people who have not repented and turned to him. And Jesus is saying it, it, it's going to happen. But that's not the reason he first came. The first advent was to bring salvation. And people didn't understand that. John the Baptist actually preached. We, uh, Jason read that for us earlier. John the Baptist preached that one comes after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, I know there's some different interpretations about what that's saying. Let me just give you mine real quick, and we can debate that later. He's not talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit where tongues came down on the people at Pentecost. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying he's going to baptize some with the Holy Spirit. Those who believe will come to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, and others he will baptize with fire, with his judgment. Those who do not come in repentance and faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. This Jesus is coming to, to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John the Baptist had a message of repentance, of warning, of judgment. And Jesus did too, but they didn't understand that that wasn't happening yet. John the Baptist didn't understand. He actually, at one point when he's in prison, he said he sent some of his followers to go ask Jesus, are you, are you the one that was promised? I'm not seeing all the judgment stuff happening. Where's your kingdom? Are you the one that was promised or should we look for someone else? And Jesus quoted from him the Old Testament, say, you've seen all these things happen. In other words, yes, I am the one who was promised to come. But Jesus said, I must first suffer many things before bringing my judgment. You know, James and John, they were called the sons of thunder. At one point, uh, they were with Jesus and they went to this town, this Samaritan town, and they were told to go in. And when this town was uh, very um, not hospitable, okay? They didn't want them. They didn't welcome them. They didn't say, yeah, come in, teach us. They were not hospitable. You know what James and John said? They turned to Jesus. They said, Jesus, you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> Why? Because that's, they thought that's... A, so actually, their question is based on faith. They thought that... I mean, they remembered the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus, is it time? Should we, you know, is your kingdom coming now? Should we tell fire to come down from heaven? Because you said in, in Daniel that we would reign and rule with you. You want us to do this for you? Jesus rebuked them, it says. Why? It's not time yet. I came to seek and save the lost. My first advent was about salvation. I will come again. 
and I will bring my recompense. And this is what happens in Acts chapter 1. Jesus is ascended into heaven, and all his believers, all his disciples are sitting there staring at the clouds. And an angel appears and said, what are you looking at? He's going to come back the same way he went up. He's going to come back on clouds. He's going to come back in the clouds, with the clouds, just like Daniel promised. But when he comes back this time, he is bringing his righteous judgment. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up with football news at all, and I know there's different people who kind of have different feelings about this situation, but Deion Sanders was just named head coach of Colorado University, the Buffaloes. Um, I, I have been following Deion Sanders for a, a couple months now. His son posts different videos on YouTube and stuff, and he's kind of branding himself. And what he was doing at Jackson State was really, really neat, really good excellent coach in my opinion so i know there's different opinions on this you know why did he leave it was it too soon all this kind of stuff but he now has an opportunity to coach at colorado and <clears throat> this was part of his first speech to the players now there's a little bit of context here you need to know colorado just went one and eleven in the season that means they lost uh they won one game and they lost eleven not good um, not a good football team, that, not a good situation. So they're bringing Deion Sanders is in. He completely turned around Jackson State. Uh, the program, everything that's going on there, he completely turned it, turned it around. And now he's coming to Colorado. And here's what he said in that first team meeting. He said, um, just so you know, I've got some unfinished business to do at Jackson State. We're going to go win the championship and then shortly thereafter, I want you to know, I'm coming. Not to compete, but to win. Not to show up, but to show out. I'm coming. I'm flat out coming to restore, to replace, to re-energize. Some of y'all sitting in a seat ain't going to have a seat when I get back. I'm coming. He said, it's going to be a different place, a different feel, a different attitude, a different energy, a different want, a different hunger, a different desire, a different need, a different capacity, a different reach. I'm coming. You're starting to know what I'm saying, and I've got the credentials to back it up. I'm coming. No more mediocrity. I'm coming. Some of y'all want it and love it, but are playing beside guys that don't want it and don't even love the game. I promise you, it's my job to get rid of them. I'm coming. If you don't respect this opportunity, I'm coming. Some of y'all don't think you deserve it or won't get a chance. I'm coming. God's sending me to be a conduit of change. I'm coming. And it ain't going to be no more mess that your fans, your students, and your parents have put up with for two decades now. I'm coming. And when I get here, there's going to be change. So I want y'all to get ready. I'm coming. And when they ask you, Hey, what did he say in that meeting? I just want you to tell him two words. Flat out, I want you to tell him, I said, I'm coming. Now, I don't know about you. That's kind of cool, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he like just spitball that or if he memorized the whole thing or whatever, but you can go watch this video on YouTube. And it, I mean, I get chills saying it now, and I got chills watching it. And you see all these players, and some of them are fired up. Some of them are scared. And what's he saying? He's given us a picture. Now, Deion Sanders is not Jesus, okay? And uh, maybe he can turn the football program around, and maybe he will. But when Jesus says, I'm coming, he means it. And when Jesus says, here's what things are going to be like when I come back, he really can back it up. And he will back it up. So in this Christmas season, Jesus came in his first advent, to bring salvation. And that is good news for all of us who are sinners. That if we repent and believe in him, we will be saved. But he's made another promise that he will come back again. And when he comes, he's bringing judgment, righteous judgment on all the earth. And anyone who is not trusting in him by faith have, has repented of their sins, has turned to him, trusting him for forgiveness, he brings judgment. And he has the credentials to back it up. He is the God-man, the Son of Man, 
who is coming on the clouds, who is seated on the throne, and who is the king of all people. But if we serve this king, he's promised that we will reign with him. We will be with him forever, not because we're great, but because he's great. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're coming back in your second advent. You've promised that you would return. You've promised that you are coming back soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Give us patience as we wait. Help us to love our fellow human beings who need to hear this message of salvation, but also this message of warning. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to trust in you. Lord, help us to communicate this in a way that is kind. Too many of us, myself included, when we talk about this, we're either flippant, almost as if there's, it's, it's just a fact, there's no compassion, or we ourselves feel like we have some kind of righteousness over someone, like we've figured it out. God, help us. Help us to warn our friends, our family, because we love them. Help us to see people come to Jesus in faith and repentance, that they might know this King, this good King, this gracious King, but this righteous King who is coming in judgment. Pray that we would really um, feel the weight of that. In Jesus' name, amen.